Today, we are fortunate to have Dr. Jim Dorschau give the next lecture. Dr. Dorschau is currently the Deputy Director for Clinical and Translational Research of the National Cancer Institute and the Director of the NCI's Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. From 1983 to 2004, Dr. Dorschau was the Chairman of the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center, Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutic Research. Dr. Dorschau received his undergraduate degree, magnum cum laude, from Harvard College in 1969 and graduated from Harvard Med in 1973. Following an internal medicine residency at the Mass General, he completed fellowship training in medical oncology at the NCI. We are pleased to have him give today's lecture. My name is Dr. James Dorshow. I am the Deputy Director for Clinical and Translational Research at the National Cancer Institute. And I have the pleasure of speaking to you about the subject of the role of pharmacodynamics in the development of new drugs. This really is an overall view of my talk uh, and really is the most important, this and the next, the most important slides uh, of the presentation uh, because we're going to define what it is uh, we're aiming to understand um, along <coughs> the lines of pharmacodynamic biomarkers in the development of new agents. So what is pharmacodynamics? Well, simply put, is what the drug does to the body. As opposed to pharmacokinetics, is actually what the body does to the drug, how it metabolizes the drug, how it's excreted, etc. And to understand pharmacodynamics, uh, one really needs to understand that what you're really trying to do is to develop biomarkers that will give you additional information about how a drug might work in a specific situation. So we're looking for the molecular changes that result from drug action or the alterations in the intended target of the drug, so-called proof of mechanism studies. Also, if the target is a cancer driver, for example, uh, we're interested in developing ways to demonstrate how that response to hitting the target um, has an impact on disease response, so-called proof of concept. So, more definitions. Um, what happens, what is the first thing that you're trying to measure? You're trying to understand the action that the drug produces along a specific biochemical pathway. So the primary pharmacodynamic effect is actually the intended molecular target and the effect of the agent on that target, so-called target engagement. An example would be um, a receptor for a growth factor, like epidermal growth factor receptor, and the binding of its natural ligand or the binding of a drug that alters uh, the effects, that, the downstream effects of that particular target. What's the secondary pharmacodynamic effect? Well, that would be some type of proximal biochemical change that is a direct consequence of target modulation. So an example, again, from the EGFR um, and EGF pathway might be the phosphorylation of ERK uh, or something downstream of ERK uh, that is a direct response to the initial phosphorylation of the epidermal growth factor receptor by um, uh, the, its natural target. And then what about, what is a tertiary pharmacodynamic effect? Well, that is a response that looks at whether it's in a patient or um, in, a, in a cell line or in an animal model. What is the biochemical basis for the cellular response? What is the end product of, that you're looking for in terms of target engagement? So that could be some form of cell death, uh, some other form of altered structure of the cell or alteration in the organ. Uh, that is, uh, it, it must go through a variety of different biochemical steps before one produces uh, that desired proof of concept um, uh, target. So the other thing that I'll try to make clear through a series of examples uh, today is uh, examples of what a fit for purpose biomarker means. What does it mean to be fit for purpose? Uh, well, this is really an essential concept because it, it basically means that what you're trying to measure and the assays that you develop to measure those things uh, must be directly tied to the mechanism of action of the drug. The measurements need to be robust and they need to be suitable for clinical samples because after all, we want to demonstrate in patients uh, whether or not the drug you're utilizing and we're examining has actually hit its target. And then we want to make sure that the effect produced by the drug is not simply due to chance, uh, due to chance changes in variability of uh, the target expression or effects of, on the target. The change must be large enough 
so that one can actually definitively measure an effect of the interaction. Let's go a little deeper into uh, the, the concepts of proof of mechanism and proof of concept. So you have a drug, uh, it's administered to an animal, to a person, um, and one wants to know whether or not the target is modulated. It can be a very proximal target, like a, a growth factor receptor, as I said. It can be something that is downstream from that target, related to the effect that you're overall looking for, but it has to be uh, directly uh, measurable. Um, and it needs to be measurable in a tissue that you're interested in. I'm a medical oncologist, so I'm interested in measuring the effects for the most part in tumors. Um, but if the, if the drug is an antihypertensive a drug, for example, or a drug that affects uh, the um, vascular system, there must be ways to measure the effects, the direct effects of modulating the target. Um, one has to be able to measure how much the target has been in inhibited um, and how long the inhibition has gone on, which we'll discuss in greater detail. We need to understand and be able to correlate the relationship between how much drug is in the body, uh, namely its pharmacokinetics or its metabolism, how often and how long metabolites are present, and the uh, proof of hitting the target, and what are the relationships. Um, and also, uh, very useful, is to understand whether hitting the particular target in tissues that are not your initial goal to evaluate, for example, the cardiovascular system uh, when you're looking at a cancer patient, um, or the kidney uh, when you're trying to evaluate uh, an immune modulation uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, what is the relationship between hitting the target and the toxicology and the, as well as the efficacy of the agent? And finally, how does hitting the target actually have an impact on the overall effectiveness of the agent as well as its toxicity? Well, that's the, the early pharmacodynamic response is one related to demonstrating that the proof of mechanism exists in a clinical situation, either in an animal um, or uh, in, in a patient. Uh, but ultimately, one wants to understand whether there's a relationship between hitting the target um, and so-called proof of concept. That is, what are the functional consequences of altering the target, inhibiting the target, activating the target? Does it affect proliferation? Does it affect metabolism of an organ or of a, or, or of a tumor? Does it affect blood flow? Um, and does it affect some critical endpoint, namely DNA damage, that is actually essential to the viability of the tumor uh, or of other tissues uh, per se. Proof of mechanism resulting in proof of concept. Um, two critical uh, concepts that I'd like to make sure that you understand. So why worry about this uh, major uh, undertaking of trying to understand whether or not you're actually engaging the target of interest? And that really is uh, demonstrated in this pie chart, which comes from a, a paper uh, that reviews uh, along a, a whole variety of different uh, types of drugs across many drug classes, not just oncologic drugs, but um, vascular drugs, uh, drugs for uh, uh, arthritis, uh, drugs for pulmonary uh, diseases. And what you see is that over the last 10 or 15 years, um, it's very clear that we can produce drugs that have their appropriate bioavailability and pharmacokinetics. Very rarely do drugs fail because the pharmacokinetics are bad. Sometimes, unavoidably, there are safety issues, and that accounts for less than a quarter of the reasons that phase two trials fail. Um, about 30% of the time, it turns out that drugs don't really fail, but they're withdrawn from after or during phase two evaluations because there are strategic issues. Another drug uh, comes on that is more effective, and they're withdrawn from the market. But most importantly, over half of the time, uh, the reason that drugs fail is that they simply don't work. Um, and so if one in gets to the point of having finished a phase one trial, you know the safe dose and schedule, you know the toxicologic profile, uh, it still turns out that half of the time your drug is not going to demonstrate efficacy. Um, and all of the efforts related to understanding molecular pharmacodynamics are really efforts uh, trying to decrease that percentage, uh, to increase the, the, the number of times when you have an agent and you go to understand how it might work, that you have a better chance of succeeding. Looking at this in another way, and again, this is data uh, from Pfizer, uh, published about five years ago now, um, for 44 uh, agents across the spectrum of molecular entities, in which they tried to understand when and how they could avoid 
phase two failures. So it turns out that about a third of the time, if you have a way of understanding the proof of mechanism, um, then the drug is effective, uh, then you've, you're, you've succeeded. And the, it's very highly likely that your phase three trial will then be successful. It's also true that for about uh, 20%, 25% of these, uh, of these cases, um, when the evaluation done in the clinical trial allowed for proof of mechanism, uh, and then if the drug didn't work even in those circumstances, and there are many reasons why that uh, should happen, um, you know that you can walk away from the development of that agent because you've hit your target, but some understanding of the downstream biochemistry and pharmacology of the agent was probably faulty. And so hitting the target did not necessarily produce tumor shrinkage or lower your blood pressure or any other of the proof of concept endpoints that you were looking for. What's truly um, amazing, and this was, uh, these are data only, as I say, five years old, is that somewhere between 40 and 45 percent of these agents that Pfizer was developing failed in testing and there was no evidence of uh, and in fact, no attempt to understand proof of mechanism. And so while the trial was a failure, there was no better understanding of why the drug failed. And so the so-called three pillars of survival and success for drug development that devised by Pfizer scientists are one, that to be successful, you need to be able to measure the required exposure at the site of action. You need to know that your drug is getting to the target for a sufficiently long period of time and at sufficient con concentration to actually inhibit the target. You need to know that uh, uh, there is appropriate binding um, and, that it, it may, uh, and that the effects on the receptor, for example, uh, may be long-lived. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, one needs to be able to demonstrate that hitting the target, uh, hitting, altering the receptor, produces the relevant downstream effect uh, that you're looking for so that you will get, you'll have proof of concept. Let's talk about uh, a variety of drugs. I'm a medical oncologist, and so I'm most familiar with oncologic drug classes. But clearly, this uh, applies in a variety of different ways to antihypertensives, uh, to anti-infectives. Um, and it's, it, it's, 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 in many ways, much easier in some other uh, aspects of uh, drug development. Um, it's not hard to understand what the biomarker is for an antihypertensive. It's blood pressure. It's control of blood pressure, duration, depth, et cetera. Um, and you have, you can demonstrate directly if that is the proof of mechanism uh, that that has occurred. Um, on the other hand, it is truly remarkable how many very effective anti-cancer agents um, have been developed with no biomarker at all. So here's the, here's the distinction. We have drugs, for example, that uh, are targeted against the HER2 oncogene. Trastuzumab is a well-known antibody, also known as Herceptin. We know that that drug only works in women whose breast cancers express uh, HER2 at a sufficiently high level or have amplification of the HER2 gene. So we can find those 20 or 25 percent of women who have tumors that uh, demonstrate that biomarker. And the success for that antibody, trastuzumab, is on the order of two-thirds to 75 percent of patients will have a response. Uh, in patients who do not have that biomarker, the odds of success are very small. Not nil, but somewhere in the range of uh, 5% uh, or less. We know very clearly from studies done about a decade ago that drugs that target the EGFR uh, receptor um, in non-small cell lung cancer, if one has a specific mutation in that um, receptor, one can uh, increase the likelihood of knowing that the likelihood of response is going to increase from 15 to 20 percent in unselected patients to probably over two-thirds, maybe three-quarters of patients if that mutational status is, is, is clear. But many of our standardly used, commercially approved drugs, whether they're cytotoxins uh, that target DNA, like alkylating agents, or they're targeted agents, for example, the MET inhibitors that uh, uh, affect the phosphorylation status of the CMET oncogene, um, we know that there's efficacy, but we cannot predict the efficacy because we have no way of knowing and no assays that we can use to understand how and in what groups and at what concentrations the drugs must be administered and under what schedules uh, that we definitely are, can expect a clinical response. So I'm going to make the argument, and the argument uh, uh, throughout this talk, 
uh, that it's really the ability to understand proof of mechanism that allows one to do modern drug development based on pharmacodynamic biomarkers. You need to have the ability to uh, understand whether proof of mechanism uh, can be demonstrated uh, in an in vivo situation, and in particularly in patients, so that the hypotheses that have led to the development of the drug um, and surrounding its mechanism of action actually can be shown to be true in vivo. Many, many agents in the history of oncologic drug development over the last 40 or 50 years have had hypotheses about specific mechanisms of action. Once they have been applied in patients, either that mechanism of action has been shown to be unequivocally not the case and other mechanisms have come forward, uh, or uh, those drugs have often failed in development because we could not come up with another hypothesis to really better test uh, that drug or members of its class. Knowing whether or not the drug uh, in question modulates the target also assists in understanding whether or not one should move from phase one to phase two or even further uh, into very large, very expensive phase three trials. This is particularly important when understanding drug schedules and um, the concentrations of, uh, and the exposures that occur in patients. Because there are many drugs that we have, at least in the oncologic field, that because of differences in metabolism um, and a variety of pharmacogenetic parameters that exist in mouse models, rat models, uh, even in outbred dog models, uh, demonstrate that an agent that works fantastically well uh, in a mouse model because of altered drug uh, clearance in humans versus mice uh, doesn't work at all uh, in patients. So ultimately, this un understanding of whether there's proof of mechanism that's been demonstrated needs to be done in patients. The other thing these early proof of mechanism studies allow one to do is to find out whether or not there is value in non-invasively understanding proof of mechanism. It's because it is difficult, and I'll, we'll talk about that, uh, to obtain multiple biopsies in patients. Uh, sometimes tumors are in sites that are not safely uh, accessible. Uh, if there are potential PET scanning approaches, metabolic approaches that can be assessed uh, by MRI, for example, that really reflect proof of mechanism, it gives you the value. The, doing these early studies where one uh, very carefully and intensively evaluates possible mechanisms of action uh, in patients are of great value. And also, it can give you some understanding of whether you should um, expect efficacy. So if the drug does not hit its target in a pilot study, then the expectation that there will be an effective agent moving into phase two and later studies is lowered. The other whole area of exploration that has not been done in a way that uh, as carefully as it might have is trying to understand molecular effects of a particular agent pharmacodynamic effects in the, in the understanding of effects of the agents on non-malignant tissues. So trying to understand the molecular toxicology of an agent. Uh, this has been done to some degree. Uh, e the first generation EGFR inhibitors all inhibit the signaling of the EGF receptor, not just in tumors, but also in normal tissues. And so it's very common for patients treated with those diseases to get a very particular maculopapular rash it looks like acne around hair follicles. Um, and at first, this wasn't clear why this happened. And it's, of course, now been uh, well documented that the uh, density of EGF, uh, reset the EGF receptor around the base of the hair follicle is very high. And so this is really demonstrative proof of mechanism binding to the target in a non-malignant um, tissue. It, it also helps you understand uh, the potential for toxicity at that site. Lastly, I think it's really very important when considering this first step um, in doing uh, the development of a new drug to understand that demonstrating proof of mechanism in an early study is not necessarily predictive of clinical benefit. Only large, later stage studies uh, can demonstrate that a particular biomarker, which has been demonstrated to be fit for purpose in a mechanism study is actually going to be predictive of activity um, in the clinic. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to try to hit by example uh, several of these, if not all of these topics. And we're going to talk about the development of the right assay for the target in question. Uh, I think it's critical to understand whether the target is suitable uh, for the purpose envisaged. Um, we're going to talk 
a fair amount about assay validation and clinical readiness before you start your trial. Demonstrate, demonstrating tissue acquisition and handling characteristics for each particular assay is also essential because it's often these somewhat boring, um, repetitive kinds of tasks that um, are hard to be, um, from a scientific perspective, be uh, enthusiastic about, are the, are the major reasons why the development of a particular drug doesn't work because we didn't know how to handle the specimens um, of, uh, of interest. We're going to talk about and show demonstrations of uh, how you approach proof of mechanism studies um, and what, that, what you can learn when the proof of mechanism is not demonstrated. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about combinations and understanding the relationship between dose and schedule and target inhibition. Uh, finally, I'm going to close with uh, an evaluation of how we're trying to develop a multiplex approach to PD biomarker assay development so we can understand at this in simultaneously how a whole variety of different uh, markers change in the same geometric space in 3D. And finally, I'm going to suggest to you how drug development, at least in cancer, has changed very dramatically over the last few decades and suggest what the state of the art is now. So the first thing I'd like to make clear is that uh, I doubt very many of uh, you who are watching this presentation actually know what some of these uh, various uh, uh, instruments actually are uh, because some of them are really very old. Um, but the point is that in when you're trying to understand a proof of mechanism, you've got to match the technology to the, your needs uh, at hand. Um, and so you've got to first be able to measure um, the amount of drug uh, in the blood and in the tissue. And then you've got to measure various parameters, specific parameters about the target. So in the mid to late 1960s, we're talking over 50 years ago, um, one could measure uh, concentrations of anti-cancer drugs, the very early drugs, in the range of 100 micromolar, 200 micromolar, rarely if ever achieved in patients through the use of a very simple spectrophotometric approach. That then morphed to various chromatographic approaches. The second uh, of these images uh, shows a paper chromatogram. Probably this is so old that not even grade school or junior high school biochemistry uh, biology classes uh, do this. I doubt there's anybody that knows what drug we used to measure using thin layer um, silica gel chromatography, but this was the standard way to measure the pharmacokinetics of the anthracycline antibiotics, doxorubicin, for example, uh, in the 70s uh, through the, the early 80s. Finally, in the early 1980s, various types of instruments that uh, could measure uh, uh, the levels of drugs in blood or in tissue into the uh, nanomolar range, namely high performance liquid chromatograms became available. And now, if you're talking about the last 10 or 15 years, no self-respecting um, pharmacokinetic laboratory would not have the latest uh, liquid chromatograph mass spectrometer that uh, measures picomolar levels of drugs uh, that which can be uh, measured both in blood and in tissue um, for almost any agent that we choose to measure. And so I'd like to make the point that that is the evolution of pharmacokinetic uh, evaluation. And the same thing has happened in terms of developing assays for early stage proof of mechanism studies. Uh, prior to about 15 years ago, one measured drug growth in animals um, with a caliper. Um, one had the ability to measure the amount of blood, uh, amount of drug in the blood um, with an HPLC. But the notion that we would have genomic biomarkers we would be able to apply those to tumor um, using next generation sequencing, that we would be able to have very sophisticated mass spectrometry that could demonstrate proteomic changes, including phosphoproteomic changes. Really, we're only in the, at the very earliest stage of having the kinds of very, very sensitive ways to measure whether or not the drug of interest has actually hit its target. And the blooming of this, uh, of the variety of assays that are available makes it essential that as you're considering uh, doing a new drug study that you have a very good understanding of both the specificity and the limits of detection of the molecules that you're attempting to evaluate in your trials. So it takes some time to understand 
what is the right assay and what is the right tool uh, that you need to employ to measure what you want to measure. The next issue is, as I described before, is the issue of having a fit-for-purpose biomarker. So this may sound uh, difficult to understand. It's actually quite simple. Um, depending on the type of study that's what you're doing, you've got to be able to demonstrate a statistically significant response um, in the biomarker of interest. So uh, as some of you know, about 10 years ago, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration put out an exploratory uh, drug development guidance for so-called phase zero trials. These are pilot studies in which one has a very, very sensitive assay and a drug that produces changes in that particular molecular characteristic at very low dose, at non-toxic doses. And if that is your goal, to be able to demonstrate a proof of mechanism with a, perhaps a single, only a small number of doses of a very potent drug, then it's essential that the baseline variability for the analyte of interest um, be small so that when non-toxic doses of a particular drug are administered, one has the opportunity, when it's even possible, to demonstrate a significant uh, impact uh, on the analyte. On the other hand, if you are doing a study that involves escalating the dose of a drug uh, into the toxic range, uh, which is still, unfortunately, uh, often the case, and sometimes it's necessary for phase one and two oncologic studies, then the amount of variability can be greater, but the necessity uh, is that you go to a much higher level of drug, potentially even a toxic level of drug, uh, so that the impact on the analyte is sufficiently great so that differences can be demonstrated and one can be sure that the target um, has been engaged. I'd like to next turn to uh, something that uh, has, for many years, and at least in the oncologic field, is still an issue of, of time and money and expertise and hinders and continues to hinder oncologic drug development. And that is um, the development of sufficiently robust assays for the estimation of the effect of a drug on a particular biomarker. Um, this is not a simple undertaking. Um, it is an expensive undertaking because mo for the most part, not always, but for the most part, the ass assays that are uh, clearly appropriate for uh, a laboratory phenomenon that's being investigated are not sufficiently sensitive for the kinds of changes that are likely to occur in patients. And so, as I said, the assay format, format and the platform that are chosen uh, and the appropriate instrumentation are essential. Um, but one has to do something more than just giving the drug, doing a biopsy, and then measuring something. Because one has to have the appropriate uh, controls to understand um, that is your analyte actually changing, and does, is it changing in the tissue of interest? Um, can you develop your own standards that have been quality controlled um, and can be spiked into a tissue sample to demonstrate that what you're actually trying to measure is stable in the tissue of interest. Um, one needs to know what is the appropriate concentration relation, dose response relationship for the agent on the target market modulation in cultured cells and in in vivo models. Um, what's the assay sensitivity uh, if there are going to be multiple determinations on the same sample. Uh, can you freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw the sample that you've obtained? How do you, what is the level of variability that's acceptable in the measurements? And I think perhaps the most important and the thing that is least often done, to what degree do you pay attention to these validation issues? Um, do you have master lots of the reagents? Do you understand that when you buy an animal, an antibody, or for that matter, uh, various kinds of uh, animals for your animal models, that there can be genetic drift, there can be changes in the antibody, even though the, um, when you go to the website for that manufacturer, they, they tell you that you're getting the same uh, antibody uh, targeting the same um, particular receptor or protein. Uh, but do you know that it has changed? What happens when they run out of a particular lot? Um, do you have the wherewithal to, to actually QC multiple lots of a particular antibody so that you can guarantee that when you do the assay over the course of a year, two years, or three years, that your measurements uh, will be stable? 
Is the assay, uh, is it linear? Um, and can you do the assay in different places? Um, this is, this may, again may sound um, very trivial, but I've had the experience of having two laboratories performing precisely the same assay with, with a standard operating procedure, an SOP in place in both laboratories, using the identical instrument in both places, and then having great concordance between those laboratories and to have all of that fall apart uh, over the course of a week or two. Why? Because at one of the sites, uh, the company came in doing its routine maintenance for the um, instrument, installed an upgraded software package, which completely changed the uh, linear dose response curves, the standard curves. Um, we actually had to get the company to come back and uninstall the new software, reinstall the old software, so that we could have values that were maintained and were concordant from laboratory to laboratory. Many things that's under standard, uh, basic, preclinical laboratory situations uh, would not be something that you would be concerned with necessarily. Let me give you an example about how important analyte handling, tissue handling is. Uh, this is uh, uh, obviously a nude mouse that has uh, on its flank uh, a human A375 uh, melanoma xenograft. Uh, and what you're seeing are examples of three different ways to do a small 18-gauge needle biopsy of that tumor. In the upper left, is it using a standard biopsy needle. Uh, one basically does exactly what an interventional radiologist might do when going after a liver metastasis. Uh, at the bottom right, you see what would happen if a surgeon excised a nodule in the liver and then that were used to measure a particular biomarker. And then the lower left and the upper right, uh, you see uh, an 18-gauge needle biopsy instrument that uh, actually when the trocar is inserted into the tumor is attached to a, uh, dry, a, a CO2 source which freezes the tumor in, sight, in situ before the tumor uh, is cut um, and then uh, disengaged and then processed. So we have standard excisional biopsy, standard needle biopsy, and a special biopsy needle which freezes the tissue in place before the blood supply is cut off and then cuts uh, the tumor. So what happens? Here's a Western uh, blot for uh, the phospho-AKT in those various samples. And if I hadn't just gone through the previous slide showing you how the different tissues uh, were handled, but rather had told you that we were evaluating a new AKT inhibitor, you might have imagined that the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth lanes uh, were, were really potent uh, AKT inhibitors. But in fact, these animals got no drug whatsoever. Um, the, these animals had the standard fine needle aspiration and with a cutting biopsy. Uh, they had some phospho-AKT that was left. Here we see that the time it takes to resect the tumor and to put it into liquid nitrogen uh, namely, um, a minute, two minutes, uh, produce a substantial decrease in the phospho-AKT signal. Um, this is something that most individuals are not aware of. Um, it can dramatically affect the results of your correlative studies. And basically, is, as I'll show uh, in a few slides, is not uncommon across a variety of different phosphoproteins, but it's also not universal. So basically, depending on what the um, target might be, one has to perform these kinds of experiments for each individual target to understand and provide um, the, the techniques necessary uh, to employ, uh, to, that need to be employed for, to preserve the analyte, uh, if at all possible. So we've talked about um, the need for uh, kind of doing a, uh, if you will, a clinical dry run on a preclinical sample so that the preclinical procedures for sample acquisition and handling are well characterized. And here's a, a, a mouse getting an 18-gauge needle biopsy. Here you see this very small piece of tumor that to the uh, H&E stain um, of this tumor is shown uh, on the right. And, and we, what we routinely do and what uh, laboratories that are actively engaged in developing pharmacokinetic assays, excuse me, pharmacodynamic assays do is to utilize these models 
to understand what the storage requirements and transferability of uh, the tumors might be, what the time frames are, uh, can we, uh, in the handling, uh, how long can we freeze these samples uh, before uh, the signal deteriorates? Is there variation and how much variation uh, goes on from a tumor on the right side of the animal versus the left side of the animal, from one biopsy site to another biopsy site? We can basically do a clinical readiness assessment uh, to understand the minimum dose required to um, engage the target. Um, and we can understand from preclinical experiments in, ex in living models, whether it's uh, a mouse, a rat, or a dog, uh, whether or not surrogate tissues are useful. Uh, and then last but absolutely not least, one can mimic um, in a dry run the actual clinical um, process by which these specimens will be obtained. This is particularly useful and important uh, if you are working in an institution where, for example, not all the buildings, the hospital, your laboratory, uh, are connected. This is something we get a lot of practice doing uh, at uh, the NIH because the clinical center hospital where the interventional radiologists perform these procedures is actually a substantial walk uh, to our laboratory on a different part of the campus. Um, one needs to demonstrate unequivocally that in the time required to carry the samples, even if they have been um, suitably obtained, uh, in that time that it takes to move the sample from one place to the laboratory where it's going to be obsessed, there aren't very substantial differences in the levels of your biomarker. And then only then, after you've done all of that, can you start uh, to, uh, to understand whether you can demonstrate proof of mechanism in patients. So now let me talk a little bit about heterogeneity and the types of assays that you can perform in the different kinds of tissues that you have available. Um, because this is, again, an issue that has gotten a scant appreciation in the literature. Um, and it really is of great, great importance. Um, we have done, over the last year and a half, two years, uh, a very detailed analysis of results of our biopsies obtained from patients that are treated in the phase one clinic at the National Cancer Institute at the NIH Clinical Center. And these were, procedures were all performed by expert uh, in the interventional radiologists. But what I'm going to show you is how important it is for those individuals to understand, as well as the pathologists that one is working with, that trying to obtain tissue for pharmacodynamic est estimation is very different than uh, trying to obtain uh, the, a biopsy to demonstrate that a tumor has metastasized, for which one might need a very small number of cells. Um, we are used to, in medical oncology and other forms of oncologic practice, uh, needing to obtain only the tissue necessary to make a pathologic diagnosis. That mindset is really diametrically opposed to obtaining as much tissue as possible to understand whether or not uh, you have affected uh, a particular molecular target in the patient. So let me just run through. These are, these are actually samples obtained from patients in the clinic that I attend. Um, and on the far right um, is a, a piece of tissue from an 18-gauge needle biopsy uh, that shows beautiful normal liver, not a single cancer cell. Um, next to it on, on the right it shows a very hypocellular um, tissue uh, for, that actually has uh, a few uh, tumor cells might be enough for a pathologic diagnosis of recurrence, uh, nowhere near enough to do a pharmacodynamic assay. In the middle, you can see outlined in green, outlined by a radiologist, excuse me, by a pathologist, areas of nests of pathologic uh, a tumor uh, of, uh, in this case, it was a colon cancer that had uh, metastasized uh, to the liver. Um, no question there's enough tissue for a pathologic confirmation of metastasis, but nowhere near enough tissue to analyze uh, for a particular molecular marker. The samples on the left and, the, and one in from the left uh, demonstrate on the far left a tumor that is about 90-90% tumor. Um, and that makes our life much easier. Um, whereas in the sample that is one in from the left, you show marked in green multiple areas, sufficient areas of tumor 
that are amenable to certain kinds of assays, which I'll talk about, um, but insufficient for other kinds of assays. And what, do, what am I talking about? Well, if you've developed a, a way to measure proof of mechanism um, by developing an ELISA assay, for example, you're going to grind up this entire piece of tissue uh, and then uh, try to measure the analyte of interest. In, the, in this case, it might be dephosphorylation of the MET oncoprotein, uh, measurement of uh, dephosphorylation of AKT, and so on. Um, in the case of a tumor that is, has uh, more than 50 percent, is more than 50 percent uh, homogeneously tumor, one can get an estimate of the particular target effect uh, that is likely to be uh, quite representative of the tissue as a whole. On the other hand, if there's 25 percent uh, tumor, uh, less than 50, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent tumor, it's very unlikely that an assay that requires homogenization of the tissue will actually give you a representative sampling of tumor versus normal cells that is useful for the estimation of the impact of your drug on the, on the tumor. And hence, what we have done, and which I'll explain in a minute, is to try to evaluate and demonstrate uh, assays that can util utilize um, intact tissue from fixed tumor specimens, utilizing quantitative immunofluorescent assays that can estimate from small but definitive amounts of tumor whether the target has been occupied or altered um, in such a way uh, that you have confidence that in the tumor of interest uh, the target has been altered. So here's a, a, a rough estimate of um, a series of about uh, 75, 73 uh, biopsies from our clinic over the last couple of years. And what you see is that uh, starting out, uh, a very substantial percentage of our uh, tumor tissues, uh, roughly two-thirds, had insufficient amounts of tissue for any kind of assay. So putting through a patient through the kinds of procedures, invasive procedures that are really important for understanding mechanism of action of these drugs, when two-thirds of the time uh, one doesn't have sufficient tumor in the pre- or post-treatment biopsy to actually make a measurement uh, really is bordering on, bordering on uh, something that might be conceived to be uh, unethical. And so we've spent a considerable amount of time trying to understand how can we make the tissues that we utilize uh, more, uh, how can we improve the analyzability of those tissues. So one thing that we've done is to be able uh, to utilize a, a larger number of biopsy passes uh, whenever the tissue is biopsied in the first place. Not one or two, but we routinely get three or four different passes both pretreatment and during or after treatment uh, so that their odds go up in terms of finding analyzable tumor. We've also uh, basically said that if a pathologist can give us uh, a site of tumor that is sufficiently representative, we really only need one such site uh, as shown in the Im image in the upper left to be able to do for quantitative immunohistochemistry uh, an analysis that is likely to be legitimate. When you do that, the likelihood that you'll get be successful is somewhere between two and three and three out of four. Uh, the other way that we have uh, substantially increased uh, our ability to get these tissues and analyze them is actually to meet with our team of in interventional radiologists on a regular basis, show them the scans of the patients that we hope to biopsy, and really assist them um, in trying to go after the lesions that are less likely to have necrotic cores and more likely to have a sufficiently high amount of viable tumor to enhance the ability to analyze those tissues. But as you see in the upper uh, panel, uh, that uh, most of the time when the tissue is insufficient, it's because the, the tumor content is just too low. Either there's no tumor possible uh, that can possibly be detected, or it is too low to do the assay of interest. And so we are working diligently to try to find better ways to develop needles that can be placed in tumors uh, with an enhanced understanding and um, confidence that the material that we will withdraw from the patient um, is actually uh, <clears throat> something that is recognizable uh, as malignant and representative uh, for that tissue uh, of, of interest. So let me give you an example of a, an assay that we recently developed uh, to get a sense of how one goes about doing that. 
So phosphomet is an important oncogene. Um, it uh, is important on its own for, the, for driving the uh, oncologic and the oncogenic uh, growth of hereditary, hereditary uh, papillary renal cancers, but also appears to um, be overexpressed in many patients with non-small cell lung cancer as one mechanism of resistance to epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors. And so we were very interested in trying to much more specifically understand uh, whether or not the, one could improve upon the immunohistochemical assays that are available, that had been and were available uh, for uh, phosphomet, uh, and also to look at uh, different sites, different phosphotyrosines that the drugs that are currently available and being evaluated actually target. And so we developed a sandwich uh, immunoassay. Uh, and what you can see in vitro is that um, in the absence of any treatment uh, for the GTL16, which is a gastric uh, adenocarcinoma cell line that constitutively overexpresses um, phosphomet because of a gene amplification, uh, it's easy to demonstrate the presence of the phosphomet on the plasma membrane. In the HT29 colon cancer cell line, there is a very modest, a real but modest amount of MET expression. And the A549 um, human lung cancer line, there's basically no uh, phosphomet expression. We can treat these cell lines with a drug um, that uh, is commercially available. It's called crizotinib. And this demonstrates very clearly that one can inhibit uh, the expression of phosphomet. One can use another drug, another phosphotyrosine um, agent that does not target MET, targets uh, vascular endothelial growth factor and other uh, receptor tyrosine kinase and show that it has absolutely no effect uh, on the uh, expression of phosphomet. We can then show very nicely uh, using a xenograft model, we can model the doses um, that are required to get both inhibition of growth, so as we get, an, we have a nice dose response curve here for crizotinib, showing that as we increase the dose of crizotinib, the growth of the tumor progressively declines and one actually gets some shrinkage of the tumor. One can at the same time measure the expression of total MET and more importantly the phosphorylated uh, uh, tyrosines and demonstrate that in a dose-dependent fashion correlating very well with the growth in vivo there is inhibition of phosphomet. So this sounds great. We use this assay uh, to understand there, there's a dose response curve. We, and then next we did what I had suggested earlier and what you remember from the picture for phosphoate KT might be very important in terms of understanding whether the analyte has to be stabilized, can it be stabilized um, from in the in vivo situation. So here's an experiment uh, with another gastric carcinoma that overexpresses phosphomet. The animals were not treated with a drug even though uh, first glance, you might think that this is a, uh, a very nice dose response curve, except when you look at the x-axis, uh, the x-axis is in minutes, not um, necessarily related to drug doses. Uh, and what uh, this demonstrates is that uh, whether it's at 37 degrees or at room temperature, uh, when you do a tumor biopsy uh, of this xenograft, that in a, in a minute, almost 50 percent of the phosphomet is gone. Uh, if, uh, even when the samples <coughs> are done at room temp held at room temperature, if they are held at 37 degrees, so one can envision uh, this actually going on in the operating room, uh, one sees that you have less than a minute uh, to get the sample before there is substantial degradation of the phosphorylation of this protein. And so it would be impossible to demonstrate a drug effect uh, unless one uh, goes to quite extraordinary lengths to obtain the tissues in such a way uh, that there, there is not uh, a, a decrease in the target simply related to the phosphatases that are circulating within the organ. So we did, we went to those extraordinary lengths and here's an example of uh, biopsies obtained from uh, a single patient with hereditary um, papillary renal carcinoma. Uh, that has a germline mutation of MET. Um, you, it, it shows very clearly that there's overexpression of MET, uh, in this case full-length MET, uh, but it also shows something that had really never been demonstrated previously in vivo, and that is using extraordinary lengths 
uh, in, in attempting to freeze these samples uh, almost immediately after the uh, biopsy needle is retracted uh, and removed uh, from the op site, one finds out that uh, on the order of 10 to 15 percent maximum of the, the MET that is present in the tumor is actually the activating species. And so one has to be very careful if you are trying to target and prove proof of mechanism in a patient, um, one would be looking at inhibiting these levels, which are on the low side, not these levels, uh, to demo and therefore the handling of the tumor would be essential. Um, and, 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 and even that uh, might or might not be possible to demonstrate that this uh, tissue and in this tumor, one can demonstrate to that the target has been modulated. So now we've talked extensively about tumor modula uh, modulating the approach to handling the tissue. What about choosing a dose for a pharmacodynamic study? And it's not just dose, but it's schedule. Uh, because in the, and when one does in vitro cell line experiments, uh, whether we, one exposes for an hour or two hours or 24 hours, one has complete control over the area under the curve for the exposure of the tumor cell to the particular drug of interest. In vivo, it's of course much more difficult. Let's assume that you know for a particular drug uh, what the lowest biologically effective dose, the so-called biologic BED, biologic effective dose might be. Because you have done experiments to demonstrate that a dose of that drug causes a dramatic decrease um, in the target expression uh, of, uh, of the, uh, with the agent in question. Well, it's not good enough to demonstrate that the target is inhibited uh, even because in almost every case uh, one can assert and show that you have to decrease the target expression to a particular level. In some cases it's 90 percent, in some cases it's less than that. Um, but the issue is how long do you have to inhibit the target uh, to actually get a proof of concept? Does the tumor shrink? Um, and so unfortunately, mostly because the assays are so, have not generally been uh, developed, there are usually uh, very few such experiments like this done in animal models to understand what the, not just the dose, but the scheduling for that particular agent that would optimize efficacy by maximizing the uh, control of target function. So let's look at this again. Uh, let's say that you know the biologically effective dose. You give one dose every 24 hours. Um, you get an effect, but by the time you're ready for the next dose, uh, the biologic uh, effect has returned to normal. In that case, you would be very lucky to just stabilize the growth, the growth of the tumor. Um, in most cases, that would lead to some uh, ex expansion of the tumor volume. If you are fortunate enough to be able to understand in vivo uh, the schedule, whether it's twice a day, three times a day, uh, perhaps the pharmacokinetics are such the drug has a long half-life, to understand what the best schedule is, you can then target that schedule so that in this case one is giving the biologically effective dose twice a day, measuring and sampling after each dose, and demonstrating that with each successive dose, one, as the target of interest starts to recover, you are inhibiting the target again. And every time the target of interest starts to recover, it's being inhibited. So there, you're keeping the function below a particular level that can be discerned and demonstrated in vivo will actually lead to tumor shrinkage or some other biological effect. If you give less than the appropriate dose, and you give it even on a twice um, a day schedule, the tumor is going to grow because you're never going to produce a situation where the tumor target that controls the growth of the tumor is actually reached uh, and is likely to produce um, some kind of a therapeutic effect. So now I'd like to share with you a recently uh, completed clinical trial of ours that demonstrates that uh, this theoretical uh, construct that I just described actually occurs in human beings. Um, so this is a phase one trial of a combination of a phospho-AKT inhibitor and an inhibitor of the MAP kinase pathway, specifically a MEK uh, inhibitor. And in this case, we know 
that uh, in, when you add these two drugs together in cell lines, one gets synergistic uh, tumor cell kill. Uh, but in animals, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, even complete inhibition of AKT will often lead to a feedback upregulation of RAS or upstream uh, targets that will overcome the resistance to, uh, produced uh, by the, uh, overcome the therapeutic effect of inhibiting the phosphorylation of the drug. It's the very same thing as if is true for, for the MEK inhibitor um, from AstraZeneca, 6244. And so the notion that you could get synergistic killing by inhibiting two parallel pathways, um, at least in animal studies, um, was uh, found uh, to be difficult to reproduce because of the simultaneous upregulation of resistance mechanisms that target upstream uh, targets that will alleviate the inhibition produced by the drug. And so at very at minimum, for this combination to be useful, one has to demonstrate that one can achieve a concentration of both of these drugs um, when they're given together, that leads to a level of inhibition that has been shown for each single agent to be therapeutically useful. And so we performed a study uh, in which the, um, the Merck drug 2206 was given on a weekly basis. Um, the, um, inhibitor, the AZ inhibitor, the MEK inhibitor, uh, was, was given. Um, <clears throat> and uh, on the first cycle, we just measured uh, the effect uh, of uh, the MEK inhibitor, and then subsequently added the AZD to find out whether there was a, and basically whether both drugs given together could hit their individual targets and reach the goal of shrinking tumors because of this combined approach. We developed assays for phosphorylation of phospho-AKT and phosphorylation of ERK as a surrogate marker for MEK inhibition. Well, what did we find? Here are uh, 10 patients, first 10 patients that had pre and post um, biopsies of their treatment with these drugs. And what do you see? Well, unfortunately, what you see is that in no case f in the, for the um, evaluation of the expression of phospho-ERK do we come close to inhibiting the 70% inhibition target. In two patients, we inhibited phospho-AKT by greater than 70%, but not the other target. So that we had a very good idea from the pharmacodynamics that it would be unlikely to demonstrate therapeutic activity and certainly no synergy because we, we didn't even hit one of the targets, much less both. And this occurred at a dose level of both agents. It was actually found to be beyond their maximally tolerated doses. Giving these two drugs together produced synergistic toxicity rather than synergistic target inhibition. And the trial was discontinued with no patient demonstrating uh, a clear clinical benefit. Um, but because we had the assays, we, could, we knew exactly why uh, the dosing, both in terms of the schedule and, more importantly, the dose delivered, was unlikely to be useful. Let's talk about another drug class uh, where the idea is that, and this may sound awfully simplistic, um, and perhaps something that you would not necessarily believe that our colleagues in big pharma uh, would do, but this is absolutely the case the, the, in what I'm, what I'm about to show you. So we're going to show you data uh, about three different um, inhibitors of poly-ADV ribose polymerase. Uh, the Abbott drug, filiparib, the AstraZeneca drug, olaparib, which is FDA approved now for the treatment of serous ovarian cancer, and in particular uh, for women that have mutations in the BRCA genes, and also a drug called BSI-201 uh, that was developed by a small pharmaceutical company and then was purchased uh, for $500 million by Sanofi. This was the first drug in this class to get to the clinic. Uh, the randomized phase two trial of this agent in combination with uh, of two different chemotherapeutic agents uh, where the rationale for giving it was that 
inhibiting poly ADP ribose polymerization with what was thought to be a way to enhance synthetic lethality, that is to, to depress basic scission repair and therefore enhance the cytotoxic effects of those drugs on DNA, um, and that it would be likely that the combination might be a little bit more toxic, but would certainly be more effective. Um, there was a randomized phase two trial uh, with about 60 patients in each arm, demonstrating clear superiority for the combination that required, uh, that added Iniparib to uh, cisplatin and gemcitabine. About the time, not too long after uh, that study was published, we performed the following experiments. Um, in a cell line, this is a breast cancer cell line, human breast cancer cell line that carries BRCA uh, mutations. We could show very, uh, very good inhibition of the target um, and that correlated well uh, with the uh, efficacy of these two um, PARP inhibitors. But in our initial experiments demonstrated for the parent drug or its two major metabolites, we could develop, demonstrate no inhibition of the target at all in cells. None at all. Um, and using uh, an assay that I'll talk about in a minute that we had developed that was very sensitive. Um, you might say, how could this possibly be? Uh, didn't uh, the company that developed this have an assay that they could use certainly for in vivo uh, in vitro experiments, if not in vivo or in patients, to demonstrate that the target was engaged because the target is an enzyme. And so this is actually easier. It's not um, a phosphorylation site. It's an enzyme that should be easy to measure um, in small amounts of tissue. And the bottom line, which I will show you in the next slide, is that number one, um, the agents that are known or clearly were demonstrated to be uh, inhibitors of poly ADP ribose and polymerase worked very well, just as well in vivo um, as in vitro, but uh, the BSI-201 compound had no effect uh, at any concentration, at any dose, uh, up to its maximally tolerated dose in an animal on the target poly-ADP ribose polymerase. Um, what happened uh, next is not uh, so uh, unremarkable. About a month after these data were uh, presented, the company in this case now Sanofi, um, dropped development of this compound because they had invested hundreds of millions of dollars in a subsequent phase three randomized trial that showed absolutely no advan advantage to adding this compound to the chemotherapeutic agents that had been shown to be uh, advantageous in a small uh, phase two, randomized phase two trial when they tried to recapitulate that results using a much larger, more appropriate a number of patients, those results could not be recapitulated. And almost certainly the reason is because the agent did not hit its target. Uh, and so an enormous amount of money was spent uh, not only to acquire this drug, but also to perform phase three trials. And it failed miserably in the clinic because one did not have definitive evidence of in vivo target inhibition. Here are data, uh, actually a phase zero trial of the uh, voliparib, the um, AbbVie company, uh, AbbVie uh, drug, showing very nice inhibition with it at four hours after a single administration of 25 milligrams uh, of this drug. Uh, and then it, this, uh, the, these graphs show two other things. Number one, here are three patients treated at the highest dose we used, and two of the three had very strong, uh, greater than 95% inhibition uh, of uh, poly ADP ribose polymerase. And one patient uh, whose pharmacokinetics demonstrated clearly that the drug was present in the bloodstream uh, had uh, a very inadequate, only about 30% inhibition of the target. And we did extensive, studied this patient extensively and still could not figure out why it was that the drug was ineffective. We were also in other patients, these are three more patients, uh, we could show that if you administered a single dose and did a biopsy within two to four hours, uh, one could produce a very substantial inhibition. If you administered the drug and then biopsied, at six hours there was inhibition, but less. And if you administered a single dose and then waited 24 hours, uh, there was uh, a minimal amount of target inhibition, showing very clearly that for this drug to be effective, and if one believed that the target had to be inhibited for a prolonged period of time, one had to administer the drug at least on a twice a day basis. Let me uh, now turn to the issue of the detection of heterogeneous effects. 
Um, and we've, we've also implied and, and, and uh, discussed the issue of an assay that uh, needs to be done with the entire piece of tissue that you obtain, namely a, an immunoassay. Um, and how do we get around the fact that we simply don't have the tissue often to be able to do those assays, or we can do the assays, but the amount of tissue available is much less than one would have expected. We do that by developing so-called multiplex immunofluorescence assays. We take tissue that is uh, uh, fixed in formalin and then uh, cut for multiple slides um, and then develop antibodies that can react with the targets of interest, develop um, tumors that, and, and, and known calibrators that have low, medium, and high levels uh, of the analyte, and then develop ways to put tumors of interest on the same slides with our analyte, and then process them for immunofluorescence that be, can be quantitated um, by a, a computer program that can, un, can measure either the total amount of a particular color in a cell, the amount in the nucleus, or the amount of foci uh, that are present. So this is an example uh, uh, done in cell lines, but I will show you the same thing can be done uh, in tissues, where we have treated um, a, a human breast cancer cell line, uh, shown in Brightfield here, uh, with the active metabolite of a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, um, topotecan. And what you see is even in tissue culture, you can measure different components of the DNA repair pathway namely gamma H2AX, which is critical for double-strand break repair, phospho-MBS1, which, which is an earlier part of the pathway for basic excision repair, and ERCC1, uh, a different component of the uh, DNA damage repair pathway. And in adjacent cells, there are different levels of expression. And this is in tissue culture, where there cannot be any specific pharmacokinetic effect. The drug is just poured into the tissue culture dish, and yet you get activation of these different signals in adjacent cells. One can look at different ways to me measure different things, including Ki67 pro for proliferation. One can look at DNA breaks not as an effect on DNA damage, but as part of the apoptotic cascade, and show that one can get a time-dependent change in the same tumor in vivo. So this is a xenograft treated with an agent that uh, alters apoptosis, and one sees first, within a few hours, this is two hours, activation of the caspase cascade. Within four hours, there's evidence of, of um, apoptotic-related DNA damage, and then at a, only at a later time point, one sees that, that you begin to get inhibition of proliferation. Well, what about in a clinical trial? So this is a clinical trial in which the compound that inhibits poly-ADP ribose polymerase, ABT888, or viliprib, which I discussed previously, was combined with another topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, a combination that is shown to be synergistic both in culture and in animals previously. And here we have uh, the same three biomarkers, ERCC1, gamma H2AX, and phospho-MBS1. But this time, this is a clinical 18-gauge needle biopsy sample uh, in the patient uh, treated with this combination. Uh, the biopsy was taken somewhere between four and six hours after treatment. And in a quite remarkable uh, demonstration of heterogeneity, you see that there are double strand the cells that are undergoing um, double strand breaks uh, repair. There are cells in which there's activation of phospho-MBS1. But in an adjacent cell, there's no activation of phospho-MBS1. There's no activation of DNA double strand repair. Um, and there's uh, minimal, if any, activation or change in ERCC1. So we see that cells over, the, over a very small um, radius uh, uh, the, the, in that geometry, these cells are almost certainly in different phases of the cell cycle, and so they may or may not be amenable to drugs that attack uh, DNA in one fashion or another. And we're now able to measure uh, upwards of five or six different parameters and different ways that cells repair um, the damage caused by uh, different kinds of targeted agents or cytotoxic agents uh, to understand even in tumors that have tumor biopsies that have relatively small amounts of tissue uh, what 
whether the targets have been engaged where, and whether there's an, a downstream effect of that particular drug on those targets. So now I'd like to begin to, to conclude uh, some of uh, the points that I've made. So why should we try to do these proof of mechanism studies? Why does pharmacodynamics matter in the development of new drugs? Uh, whether it is a cancer-related target, it's an immune-modulated target, um, or it is a target that is appropriate for a drug that affects the kidney or the vascular system. I think the most, one of the most important uh, features is that if you, is the notion that if you cannot demonstrate proof of mechanism early on, you can, in most cases, avoid the enormously costly uh, effort involved in performing um, an ineffective uh, phase three investigation uh, that may cost anywhere from 75 to 200 million dollars. We can also, in a relatively short period of time, uh, test a variety of different analogs to understand if one is better than another in patients as opposed to what works best um, in animals. Um, one could also then be in a position to see whether, as I showed, uh, whether the predictions of targeted drug combination synergy based on mechanism of action uh, actually occur and whether that can occur in doses and at schedules that are consistent with an appropriate toxicologic uh, profile. One can look at both putative mechanisms of action and downstream effects to understand uh, how these drugs uh, might work in patients. Um, one can understand the robustness and potential predictive value, at least get an initial handle on that uh, for early in the drug development process. And really, one provides the basis for molecular characterization studies in, as one goes forward into early phase two investigations so that one can then definitively correlate efficacy with proof of mechanism. I've also, I think, made it clear that uh, unfortunately at the present time, doing this kind of clinical trial is, is not easy because to really understand what you're doing, you have to develop FDA quality assays both for target engagement and downstream effects and, toxic and for toxicity markers. Um, those assays need to be developed in advance of the first in human trial. Uh, they, need, one need, they involve not only developing an analytical, analytical procedure uh, for analytical validation and, and standard operating procedures, but also to understand all the various ways that uh, one needs to be facile with respect to definitively knowing how to and, how to spe handle the specimens um, and um, to do so uh, in a way that is appropriate to either the outpatient clinic or the inpatient service that are the arena of operations. I think it's also clear that um, it takes a lot of time and effort to produce the kind of um, robust sets of sample data and um, analytes used for controls as well as having a supply of the necessary components of the assay so that you can analyze all of the tissues obtained for your test um, under what would be the same, um, the same um, set of standard operating procedures. And finally, uh, it is no small task to understand how to disseminate the technology so that uh, extramural sites and a variety of different labs can perform these tests um, at a high, with a high level of confidence that there would be concordance from laboratory to laboratory. If you do that and you invest in these supporting assays, uh, I would propose that certainly for the development of oncologic drugs and probably for other classes of drugs, uh, one can develop in a small number of patients uh, data that demonstrates whether your assays are qualified in humans f during these pilot studies. Qualified in a way that you can then go on to phase two investigations, which give you an estimate of the accuracy of the drug effect on the tumor, and get an early read on the efficacy of the compounds in the context of whether or not uh, the mechanism of action has uh, been, uh, been demonstrated. And in that case, the size of the trials needed for definitive studies, whether they're randomized phase twos or phase three investigations, is undoubtedly smaller um, than what would be required for studies in which one has no handle 
uh, on whether or not you're hitting your target. So lastly, I'd just like to compare um, the paradigms for developing oncologic drugs uh, several decades ago for what the state of the art is now. Um, when the time that I was starting out in this, in this process, one basically took compounds that had no, that no clear demonstration in vivo of mechanism of action um, and used them to try to estimate response rates and side effects in non-randomized studies. One did this in specific tumor types using tumor histology as a surrogate for target. We now know very clearly that there are some targets that are present across histologies. Uh, it makes no sense to only use a particular agent um, in one disease or another when it might be perfectly suitable um, for a variety of different uh, uh, tissues. And so tissue agnostic clinical trials uh, are, are clearly very appropriate. And we, we almost always used drugs that had a relatively nonspecific mechanism of action. And now, uh, for a wide variety of types of patients, we have agents that are less toxic, um, where previous treatments are unlikely to affect our, the, the mechanism of action of the new agent, um, and, whether, and when we can use specific ways to demonstrate whether or not the molecules of interest produce specific effects um, on the targets that have been previously defined so that we can then use the minimum amount of data and the minimum number of patients to understand whether the drug um, development paradigm should be exercised in any one specific uh, study or any one particular type of disease. In other words, to define very early uh, whether or not a drug is worth taking to large, expensive, randomized trials. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to thank all of my colleagues at the, the NCI, uh, both the colleagues intramurally and all of the investigators that, with whom we um, actually have a variety of different interactions um, at academic sites across the country who've made these studies uh, uh, possible. Thank you very much.